Uh, so this is me, um, and that is my uh, Twitter handle and my email address uh, in case you need to get in touch with me later on after the webinar. So our agenda today, uh, we're going to um, have a look at uh, in a little bit more depth at some of the things that we might have covered in the uh, general automation bootcamp, uh, specifically parsing strings and using them for um, generating lists of items uh, to work on as a uh, uh, sort of a queue of things to uh, install. Um, we can get to uh, automating some uh, items in the system registry, uh, and hopefully we have time. We'll get down to uh, automating uh, your onboarding and you know, building out a new machine. So first things first, you will need to go and get, if you have not already, uh, and install Automation Manager. Uh, to do that, you'll sign into RMM, go to your settings, and then to Script Manager. And then the link to download and install Automation Manager is up here on the upper right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, of course, have already got it installed. Um, but one other thing that we're going to be doing uh, that may require some installation is uh, installing and running uh, some apps with Chocolatey. Uh, now, on the Mac Bootcamp, I show um, uh, for you know, Mac admins and people who are not familiar with it, um, something called Installimator. Um, and also there's a, a tool called Homebrew. Uh, those are both used for uh, installing new software, updating and patching existing software, that kind of thing. Uh, Chocolatey is the same sort of thing, uh, only for Windows, and I guess more um, Chocolatey goodness than uh, Homebrew would be. So if you are uh, interested in looking at, uh, if you, sorry, if you, if you're not already familiar with Chocolatey, the, uh, the website is chocolatey.org, um, and uh, we're going to be using that for installing some things with Automation Manager. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to fire up Automation Manager here, and I'm going to uh, create a new policy, and I'm just going to call it... Uh, Chuckle. Chuckle. Okay. Um, first things first, we're going to use Chocolatey, so we need to find the path to the, uh, the Chocolatey app itself. Um, and by default, Let's go up here. And the uh, default is something like, <laughs> yeah, there we go, program data <laughs> slash chocolatey slash choco.exe. Uh, we're also going to need a, uh, a place to store our files temporarily as they are downloaded. So um, let's create a path for that temp file. And it's you know, temp path. And it is also a string. We're going to put it in temp. OK. And finally, a list of apps that we want to install. And again, this is going to be a string and we're going to turn it into an array so that we can work on each item in the array uh, one at a time. But uh, since we can't create an input parameter of array, uh, we'll have to do 
uh, our work with a string first. Uh, and for right now, we'll just leave this value blank. Uh, we'll put that in uh, when we run the uh, policy. So now I have my inputs and uh, let me go ahead and open up a, uh, I'm going to head open up um, a pre-made version of the chocolatey policy here. Okay. So in my inputs, I have my path to chocolatey, my temp path, and then my list of apps again. So the first thing we're going to need to do is, uh, well, if we're going to use chocolatey, we need to make sure that it actually exists. Um, and so we will do that by looking for, ah, here we go. Uh, I put it down here second uh, instead. So um, we're going to use the does the file exist conditional object. And we are going to use that to check and see if, uh, where does my file exist? There we go. Okay. Um, we are going to see if the path to chocolatey and the chocolatey executable uh, is valid. And so if that returns not true, so uh, chocolatey does not exist, then we're going to need to install chocolatey. Uh, the Chocolatey website has a, and I like saying the word chocolatey. Um, the Chocolatey website has a convenient installer script that you can get just by copying this one liner here of PowerShell and pasting it into a run PowerShell script object. And this doesn't take any input parameters, but we'll just take uh, and edit the script itself. And uh, to do that, we'll just paste that, um, that one liner into uh, uh, our block here, which basically does, uh, does three things. It sets the local execution policy uh, to allow um, uh, unsigned or you know, foreign uh, PS1 files to, to uh, launch, and then uh, sets the uh, security to slightly less secure. Uh, then it downloads the um, PS1 installer and runs it from uh, chocolatey.org. And then uh, as part of that installation, well, one of the last things it does is actually changes that scope uh, and security protocol back to um, more proper uh, settings. So that is the, uh, the first part of, uh, of our script. So it's gonna run PowerShell to install Chocolatey if Chocolatey does not already exist in that, um, in that path. Next thing is, since we're going to be downloading things into a temp folder, uh, we need to make sure that that temp folder exists. And so we're going to use that same uh, same block, only this time the does the folder exist block instead of the does the file exist block. We're going to use the input parameter of our temp folder path, check to see if that exists, and if the conditional from the folder uh, comes back as not true, then we will create the folder uh, and we'll use the same path that we did before for checking. Uh, and so we'll create the folder at that path. So if both of those things already exist, then we get to bypass all of the if statements 
and go straight down to the split string object. So there's a whole bunch of string manipulation um, objects here in the you know formatting and logging area of Automation Manager. And one of the things that we can do is take a string that is a you know a list of items. Uh, let's say it's separated by semicolons and split that string into its component parts at each of the semicolons. Now the output of that split string becomes a collection. Uh, in other programming languages, scripting languages, this would probably be uh, an array or a list. Uh, in this case, it is called a collection. And then with that collection, we can act on each of the component parts individually. So and that's where we get our for each object. Drag that in here. So we uh, use the list of tokens as um, generated by the split string. And so for each of those tokens, we need to uh, install the application with Chocolaty, but the command to actually do the installation uh, won't take a token object, it needs a string. So we're gonna need to convert the string that has been converted into tokens back into strings. So we'll take the token value from that for each. And then uh, we don't really need uh, a second input because all we're going to do is take that first input and uh, spit it back out again as a string. Uh, so this really could very easily be a, uh, you know, a convert format or convert uh, variable type or you know type variable or whatever. Um, in this case, it's using the format string object to take an input that is a uh, a token or a different kind of non-string, and then it spits out a formatted string for us. So each of those formatted strings then goes into this script um, for the uh, installation via Chocolaty. And the, the command line for Chocolaty to install something is just Choco install and then the name of the app. Um, and in our PowerShell, we are using um, the variable uh, app uh, and it is a variable offset by the dollar sign. And we are populating that variable with uh, an input parameter called app name, which is the string that we got from our format string block. Now, in normal circumstances, what uh, what we could do is just have this um, this ver this input parameter in app name. Uh, go straight into the Chaco install line. Um, but uh, as far as best practices go, um, we're making this input parameter uh, generate a local variable so that, you know, if we had a much more complicated uh, PowerShell block here, um, we could, you know, reuse the variable, you know, uh, flip around its, uh, you know, the object type and, um, manipulate it and whatnot, and then spit something out at the end. Um, and so if we start doing that, there is a tendency to uh, lose track of all of the uh, the changes to that, um, to that variable. So uh, instead, what we're going to do is use this input parameter to sort of protect it from uh, what's happening inside the, uh, the PowerShell. And then um, this app variable is a uh, essentially a local variable. Uh, this doesn't require any output other than success or failure. So uh, in the end, this Choco install app uh, will then 
basically just run and install uh, the application that is listed in that app list. Uh, I've also gone through and added in a, uh, a logging item so that it would say uh, something along the lines of the, uh, this particular app was installed with Chocolatey on this particular date, uh, but that is optional. So how do we actually use this? Uh, in this case, we will, uh, we know that Chocolatey should be at this path. And my temporary folder uh, is, he, is here at uh, c colon backslash temp. And uh, my apps list I can get from the, the uh, chocolatey.org website and get a whole slew of different options. They had something like 6,900 different packages available for uh, installation um, earlier today. So I think I will take Notepad plus plus and use that as my example today. So I'm going to put Notepad++ in my list, and then maybe uh, VLC. Uh, and those two are separated by a semicolon. So when this runs, it will try and install those two items separately, because it has broken that string into two objects, converted those objects back into strings, and now it is uh, working on Notepad++, and then next it will it will try and install uh, VLC. Uh, hopefully that makes sense so far. Uh, there's a whole convoluted labyrinth of steps required uh, in this second lab just to create a desktop shortcut. So I've got a shortcut here on my desktop. And if I open it up in Notepad, you will see that it's just a text file uh, with a name uh, extension. There we go. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, with an extension of .url, um, and uh, yeah, it has uh, a couple of um, parameters in it, and uh, because I did it from Chrome, it has a Chrome icon. Um, but that's really it. It's just a text file that has some um, some lines of uh, formatted text in it. So we should be able to create our own, which will be uh, helpful if, for instance, we want to create a, uh, a shortcut on a user's desktop to you know, our website <clears throat> or to the uh, you know, YouTube channel that shows how to do uh, how to submit tickets or um, the uh, user guide for some software and so on. So this really should not be as difficult as uh, the lab manual makes it out to be. Um, but every time I try to do it in a seemingly easier way, uh, it somehow ends up not working. So I'm uh, going to have to just do it the hard way. Okay. Uh, oh, a couple of people have uh, run into problems with the uh, the chocolatey script. Um, uh, Dwayne has a suggestion: if your apps are not installing. Uh, make sure you have the dash Y at the end of your PowerShell uh, for uh, the actual chocolatey line. Uh, um, I want to open it. 
not save it, it's open. <laughs> My chocolatey script, do, 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 do. Uh, so in the script itself, oh, no, further down, this script down here, uh, you notice that uh, it is uh, ends with the dash Y option, uh, and that basically agrees to all of the, uh, are you sure you want to download and install this kind of questions that you would normally get if you were to just do it on the, um, uh, on the command line. And if you're having trouble with uh, Chocolatey actually running in the first place, uh, make sure that the uh, installation step for uh, installing Chocolatey is actually working uh, properly. Because if you get to this point and uh, this somehow errors out, um, uh, you know, the URL that it's uh, grabbing things from is somehow inaccessible or what have you, um, then uh, when you get to the step where it actually runs Chocolatey, it's not going to be able to do that. So you get an error there. So in any case, I will uh, show you how we make uh, a shortcut on a user's desktop. So if we opened up the, um, the shortcut file, like I said, it's just a text file. And the end result of this policy is that it will create a text file with uh, the necessary bits in it for it to be uh, usable as a double click and uh, open the web browser type shortcut. So we're going to start with uh, our input parameters. <clears throat> so uh, if we're going to make a shortcut to our URL, uh, obviously we need the URL to go to. So uh, in this case, it's just going to be uh, the URL string for um, the Enable Success Center. And uh, it is, of course, a type of a string. And then we need a name for our shortcut. Uh, I'm just going to call it uh, click me. So the uh, basically the file name that we are generating for uh, the icon on the desktop to uh, click on. So those are our two input variables, or input parameters, rather. In order to put something on the user's desktop, we need to find out where that user and their home directory is, so their profile uh, is. So in Automation Manager, we have uh, a whole bunch of environment variable options. We can, well, I say a bunch, but we can get, or we can set environment variables. Um, the environment variables themselves that you can get are uh, any number of things that the uh, the system uh, recognizes. So we've got all kinds of um, options here, uh, but what we're going to get is the currently logged in users profile, uh, which is uh, essentially a path to their home directory. And so uh, that uh, Environment variable is a type of, uh, you know, miscellaneous or other, uh, but in this case, uh, Windows just calls it a type of none. You know, it should be a, you know, a string or a path or something like that, but it's called none. So once we have the input parameter created uh, or, or chosen, we need to uh, create the uh, the full name for the file that we're going to um, uh, generate. So we're going to take that input parameter of the shortcut name, and then we're just going to append .url to the end of it. So we'll do the format string object, and just do that with the uh, the file name that we want and append.url. Uh, I'm actually going to modify 
my script here. So uh, instead of just adding .url to the file name, I'm actually going to <clears throat> generate the full path based on the user profile and put it on the user's desktop so I can get rid of this block here. So now the output is going to be uh, the path to the user's profile and then uh, on their desktop folder, create the file named clickme.url. In order to make sure that we're not clobbering things, uh, we need to make sure that that file does not already exist. And so we're going to do a test of if the file exists already. And for that, we need the uh, formatted string output. So does this file exist? So uh, again, we're going to do uh, an if then block. So if that file exists is true, then <clears throat> uh, well, we can just delete it because uh, it's a shortcut file. Don't have to worry too much about the uh, the contents of it. Uh, if this were something more important, like a you know photos or some other kind of document, um, then uh, we'd probably want to put it into <clears throat> the uh, recycle bin or put it into uh, an archive folder or just rename it instead of just deleting it. But in this case, we're going to uh, delete. Uh, our shortcut file and replace it with our new one of the same name. And so finally, we need to populate the, uh, the shortcut file itself with the uh, necessary magical ingredients. Uh, and to do that, we can use this output file block. And see here, if we go back to my desktop and uh, open up one of these other shortcuts here. Right. So, uh, see this stuff here? All of this is formatting and, and, um, you know, uh, pixie dust or uh, whatever you want to call it, um, to tell Windows uh, what kind of file this is, um, what kind of icon to give it, what to do when you click on it, that sort of thing. Um, the only thing that is really unique about it is this URL string down here that we added as our uh, first input parameter. So the output file block is going to need the file name, which is our formatted string file name. Uh, and it's going to need some data. In this case, it is that first piece of uh, text that's from our um, sample shortcut. And uh, in this case, the file itself is going to be empty because we just created it. Um, but with blocks like this, we can either replace what's in the file with this data, or we can append it to the end <clears throat> of the file. Um, so we're slowly building up multiple lines of text in this text file. So I've got this line in the output file block, and then another block here. Doing the uh, properties line, and then here the internet shortcut line, and then all the way down here, the actual uh, URL. So, uh, and that is uh, prepended by. Uh, the string URL equals, and then the URL itself. And finally, we're going to save that all to the URL shortcut. 
And so we'll save that and we will see if that whole convoluted mess works. Um, and uh, try it and see. So it's going through and <clears throat> creating that file name, uh, formatting the strings, and so on and so on, adding the little blocks of text to our text file. And so now my output file is complete, and I should have a uh, file on the desktop. Uh, of course, I don't see it because, of course, I don't. Well, let's see where my uh, errors lay. Oh, output parameter result one. That means that I had an error. <clears throat> so, mm, mm, mm. Uh, data URL output file failed, could not find part of the path. Ah, I see. So my user profile uh, variable, right, should be uh, getting the environment variable. Ah, I see. <clears throat> Problem was, I was getting the result string, which, as we discussed before, the result string is really just uh, whether or not something, uh, the error actually happened. Um, what I really wanted was the value of that environment variable. So now if I save this and run it, uh, I should get do to do to do to do to do all the way down here to the end. Da, 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 da. There we go. Result zero, which means no errors. So I should have a shortcut on my desktop that says try again. And when I double click on it, bang. Okay, so internet shortcut not valid. Uh, blah, 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 blah. That's really disappointing because it seems like every time I do this, it is just another way for it to break. Um, well, in any case, uh, it's probably because I have a, an errant space or some other uh, little thing that is uh, hanging out in my text uh, that is making the format uh, <clears throat> not match what uh, Windows is expecting it to be. In this demo, we are going to be talking about uh, adding things and modifying the registry, at least uh, a fairly safe and um, benign way, but still, when it comes to the registry, uh, here there be uh, dragons. So dangerous territory, at least for me. Um, so the objective of this demo uh, and the next lab is to create a policy that will check to see how long it's been since a maintenance routine has run. Uh, and if that time between maintenance runs has exceeded a preset limit, then we can tell the system to run that maintenance uh, again. So once again, back into uh, Automation Manager. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm going to uh, open up my existing version of the policy here. So my um, the policy starts with uh, a couple of inputs, uh, mainly how many days we want to have uh, as a maximum number between uh, running maintenance. So uh, if we want to run it weekly, we would make this value seven. Uh, if we want to run it um, every two weeks, uh, make it you know, 14. And then this is, uh, again, in days. So we need to remember that that's in days. Uh, and not, you know, like hours or uh, minutes or something like that. 
and then uh, we have some global variables to store our various bits and pieces uh, of data. So the uh, first variable is the last date that the uh, maintenance was run. And uh, we don't know that yet, so we're just going to leave that blank uh, for right now. And then the, uh, the type is a, uh, a date object as opposed to uh, a string or uh, something like that. Um, we're going to translate that date into a number of days so that we can do math on it. So we're going to convert that into um, uh, this other variable here, which is uh, days since the last maintenance was run. Um, and since we need to do math on it, we're going to use a, a number type object. And again, we don't know the answer, so we're going to leave that value blank. And then um, as a part of the process, we're going to uh, actually use a string to store uh, the formatted date uh, so that we can go back and forth between storing a, uh, a date as a string instead of as a date, uh, because we can only store things in the registry as uh, certain types of objects. And one of those objects, uh, unfortunately, is not a date type. So in order to do some math on the, uh, the date since something has happened, we're going to need to grab uh, today's date. So uh, this is a get date option, uh, uh, object rather, um, and it is set to get uh, uh, the current date um, and using this um, you know, default date format. Next thing we need to do if we're going to be mucking around in the registry is make sure that the registry key that we are interested in uh, modifying actually exists. And, you know, previous version of this, uh, I kept having to type that key over and over again. So I'm actually going to set it as a global variable. Um, And we call it the uh, registry key. Uh, and it is a string. And I'm going to set the value of it as software slash MSP so that I can use it multiple times without having to keep retyping that same string. Or in case I need to change it, I can change it in one place instead of in multiple. So these are the kinds of things that I do uh, as I'm going through uh, giving the uh, the boot camp, um, modifying the scripts themselves. So they do differ a bit from what's in the PDF. So uh, that's where the the things will uh, diverge a bit. Um, in any case, uh, so back to checking to see if our registry key exists um, and then we'll have uh, an if then block so if that registry key exists uh, condition is false or does not equal true then we'll need to create the registry key so there's um, a bunch of registry objects here uh, in automation manager and one of them is to uh, create a registry key to store our values in. So uh, again, I'm going to use the same uh, uh, HKLM base, um, and I'm going to use my global variable uh, as the string for the key. And then that key stores uh, property names, and we can put anything we really want to in it um, as the uh, the property name and then the property value. Um, and we're going to be mainly storing uh, 
data in it as a string. So uh, you can use your company name or uh, your MSP name or however you want to brand it so that as you're looking in the, uh, the registry, you'll be able to find your, uh, uh, your registry entries that way. Next up, once that registry key exists, uh, or if it already exists, we need to see if it has a value set on it. So I'm going to use the same sort of logic pair. Uh, so we're going to, um, does the registry, um, mm, uh, does the registry value exist at our, uh, registry key location, and we're looking for the property name of last maintained date or last made date. Uh, and so that is where we're going to test, uh, uh, that's where we're going to store uh, the date that uh, this maintenance was run on. Um, so if the registry value of the last maintained date uh, exists, then we're going to have to do a bunch of math uh, and stuff on it. Uh, but first, let's see what happens or what we need to do if that registry value does not exist. So on the else side of the if else statement, we are going to set the registry value because we have tested it and it does not exist. And the property name is last maintained date. And then the property value, we are going to uh, take the uh, result from the date block at the very beginning and store it as a string. So that gets stored in the registry. Uh, but it is also going to be uh, updating our global variable that is storing the number of days since the last maintenance was run. And since this registry value doesn't exist, we're going to assume that that uh, maintenance was never run in the past. And so days since the maintenance was run um, is just, you know, infinite, but we're just going to say uh, 999 so that uh, it will trigger the next step, which is if that number is greater than our maximum number of 14. So that is the, uh, the simpler side of the if else, and that is if that uh, registry key value does not uh, already exist. So if the last maintained date does exist, then we are going to get the value of that and while we're at it we're going to set the uh, last run date uh, global variable value to be the same thing so um, we're going to use the uh, the string that is stored in the registry uh, as the string that gets stored in our global variable Now is the, the only real tricky part of this script. All the rest is uh, so far has just been uh, logic and math. Uh, we will take the run PowerShell script block and put a, let's see here. Mm -hmm. That, copy that, because um, this, Uh, for whatever reason, is not actually in the uh, uh, the PDF. Um, so this uh, little blob of PowerShell I've put into uh, the chat for you to copy and paste. Um, but what we're doing is taking the registry value 
which is a string. And the date format string And that date format string is this custom date format here. Uh, it could be any number of uh, different date formats, um, month, day, year, year, day, month, and so on, so on, so on, as long as it uh, contains enough data to know uh, how many days it has been, as opposed to just you know, the current time and you know, hours or whatever. And this command parse exact date format, yada, 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 is going to set a variable in PowerShell of script result to a date and time object as a result of parsing this string. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a errant space in there. Um, and then as an output, we're going to take that script result variable, and uh, it is in the format of a date. So that is going to be our output parameter from this run PowerShell script block. And this is sort of the linchpin of what this whole script is doing, converting a date to a string and then back again, so that we can find the date difference between the uh, uh, result of the uh, that first block that is you know getting today's date, uh, or I could just set it to uh, just check this box now, and so uh, the uh, current date is uh, automatically put into that um, into that field, and then the second date is the result from that run PowerShell script and we're doing math on it and getting the time units in days. So the difference in days between that first date and, uh, sorry, that uh, today and that previous date will come back to us in a number format. And we're going to use, uh, again, one of our global variables that is, um, Uh, why is it doing that? Okay. Um, so taking and assigning that uh, global variable that's in the format of a number uh, to store the difference in uh, days. So all of that to decide if the number of days between the last time this maintenance script was run is greater than or equal to our input parameter that is the maximum number of days, uh, which we defaulted to 14. Um, uh, and so if it is greater than or equal to 14, then uh, in this case, it's got the DNS um, uh, maintenance block, but there's, you know, there's the um, uh, disk cleanup uh, routines that you can do here. There's, you know, disk defrag, you can uh, set an alert or whatever. Um, the main thing is that on this side of the branch, you've got the uh, running maintenance, um, choice and then on the other side under else we've got uh, basically uh, uh, adding a log to uh, adding a line to the log file that says uh, we don't need to do maintenance today it's been less than two weeks and as a bonus we are Defense global variables. Okay. Um, uh, what we need to do then is uh, 
when this maintenance task runs, we need to uh, set the registry value. And our registry key that we stored in our global variable here. And property name uh, is uh, something like that. And what we're going to do is give it a value that is equal to, give it a value that is equal to the date result for today and it is a type of string so when we run the maintenance we know that it has run uh, so the next time we run the script uh, it will check that same registry key and then um, the difference will be less than 14 days and so it won't run it uh, again for another two weeks Phew. All right, so um, hopefully everyone uh, followed along with that. And uh, let's see uh, if there were any questions. Um, Alan, that's a good question. Uh, is there a variable that holds the client ID and the site ID uh, within Automation Manager? Uh, I believe there is, um, and if there's not, uh, there is a way to get it um, from uh, either, if there's not one within here, uh, there is within uh, the API, which you can um, find on, um, you can find information on our website. Uh, and then there's also a bootcamp dedicated entirely to using the API for grabbing information about um, your uh, remote clients, things like that. Uh, on the status output window, um, But I thought there was a way to clear the output. Um, you know, I could be mistaking it for a different um, app, but uh, you know, I th thought there was a way if you like right-clicked on the um, the output block under status to uh, to clear it and only show uh new um new items but i am drawing a blank on uh how to do that right now mm -hmm. uh lab three in your um lab manual is uh, uh basically just shows you the layout of uh, the script that I just did, that I just built, um, and tasks you with, you know, downloading and um, modifying it and uh, making it work for you as a uh, um, uh, an automation policy. And so I will set that uh, as your uh, task for homework. The uh, AMP P file itself, I believe, is in the uh, automation cookbook. And let's see here, if I look under maintenance. Yeah. Uh, the script is called using the registry for maintenance and I will uh, 
pop that URL into the chat window as well. So um, basically this, uh, this script that uh, is on the cookbook is um, what is shown in the lab manual uh, and is fairly close to what I just showed you uh, in the demo. But right now, um, because that's not really in the, uh, the lab manual for you to uh, follow along with, uh, I'm going to move on to uh, the next task, which is uh, using automation for onboarding or building a new machine. All right, so next up. Um, so, uh, so you were asking about the um, uh, the input parameters for the PowerShell script here. So again, those are uh, basically just the the date um, that it was last run, and then the uh, the date format string. And again, that date format string is coming from the date format uh, up here under the uh, get today's date block. All right, so next up, we have a uh, demo for how to onboard. Uh, or build a new machine. Uh, and so we're going to give it a, um, uh, a new local user, um, uh, assign a password for that user, and then uh, do a few things for the um, uh, adding of that uh, machine to a domain. So let me let's see. I think we have it here. Okay, so this is uh, the second part of that policy. Um, create a, a new policy here that will have the uh, first part of it and as an input parameter, um, we're going to need the uh, the username for uh, uh, creating a local user on that machine. Uh, it's going to be a string, so string. Um, and then, as far as a default value. Uh, let's call it uh, MSP admin. Uh, we're also going to give that uh, uh, username a password. So I was going to say uh, admin password. Uh, and this is where we use the uh, the type of uh, object called password, and then it will ask us uh, for that password when we start up the script and use the uh, secure password field for uh, generating it. So, uh, okay. Um, before we do any adding of users on the machine, what do you expect we need to uh, check first? Uh, and that is that if the local user exists, because if we start messing around with an existing user's account, uh, that could be problematic, especially if we are going to do things like reset passwords and such. So um, going to look for a user by that same username existing on the machine. And then 
and if uh, if there we go uh, an if block so if the uh, local user exists condition is uh, equal to true uh, then probably need to uh, stop what we're doing and um, figure out why the uh, user that you're going to uh, try and create already exists so instead we'll probably want to check and make sure that it is not equal to true before we proceed um, probably put some kind of uh, else in here so if that user does exist um, then we can have an alert or a, a log an item here but instead we're just going to uh, stop there and not proceed so if the user does not exist then why we need to create the local user so creating the local user again with the input parameter of that username uh, and then I'm going to use the password that we're asking for as part of the uh, startup uh, and then we can give it an optional description uh, we could uh, if we were creating based on you know a list of names you know give it a description you know first name last name or what have you but in this case we're generating a, um, a local admin user uh, for the default uh, and so we're just going to call it msp admin um, mm, so that the new admin user uh, ah, here we go. Um, so that that new admin user is a member of the proper groups to be able to administer uh, the computer uh, we're going to uh, add in the user to a local group and then of course the group name is uh, by default administrators and then uh, unless you know for certain what the domain is going to be we can just leave that blank um, and so now we have our uh, onboarding policy part one and need to open up our existing do, 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 uh, domain policy, which is uh, going to be linked uh, to the uh, first one. Um, and it needs the uh, four input parameters here of the uh, domain name that we're going to join the um the machine to that we're building um and then uh, the username that we're going to uh use as the default user uh and then um, our default value here is administrator um i can probably change that to what we're actually using which is going to be msp admin uh an initial uh, user password so we're going to need to use the same password as the uh, the other policy and then the um, uh, the OU which is uh, what is that organizational unit um, and we're going to probably leave this blank uh, its default uh, I think is probably something like CN equals computers or something along those lines so we can leave this 
blank unless we know that it needs to be a different uh, string. The first block here, getting the system information, is going to get a bunch of um, those local um, uh, environment properties or computer properties. Um, and it just basically populates a bunch of variables within the script. And uh, so for instance, it will output uh, like the make and model, the name of the machine, um, memory and, uh, and so on. Our next, uh, next bit of logic here is if the uh, computer is already added to our domain, or which is to say, if it is not already added to the domain that we uh, want to add it to, then we can tell it to join that domain. So um, there's a bunch of domain admin type blocks here uh, for Active Directory and um, uh, Office 365 and whatnot. Uh, this is, uh, of course, assuming that your Windows machines are joined to a domain of some sort. Um, and so uh, you use your uh, knowledge of the uh, domain from the input parameters and then the username that you've hopefully put in uh, the same here and then the other policy. And then again, also, uh, you know the um, password for that domain user so that you can join that machine to the domain. Um, and then, you know, if you have a uh, organizational unit that you know uh, that the machine wants to, uh, needs to be added to, uh, you put it in there. And that's pretty much what this block of uh, uh, objects is doing. So it's just adding a machine to the domain uh, if it is not already added to that domain. If you are uh, building a machine or onboarding it for the first time, you can use these two policies, um, you know, creating a local admin user um, and then adding the machine to the domain um, and then any of the other uh, steps that you would normally go through in the um, uh, onboarding process to automatically trigger all those things to happen when you first add a machine uh, into RMM. Uh, very briefly, I will uh, show you how to use um, Automation Manager and your automation policies as a, um, let's say it's a, a workaround for not being able to make remote connections to a, uh, to a server or something. Uh, and this way, you can actually tell a remote machine to connect to another remote machine uh, and run commands uh, that you've scripted uh, via SSH. So uh, remote shell session into something like a Linux box or a Mac uh, or a Windows server provided that it has uh, SSH turned on as uh, an accessible connection. So this is a kind of a simple um, uh, demonstration, but uh, hopefully you can um, use your imagination for something that you might find it more um, uh, more useful for uh, that is more complicated. So we're going to start with our input parameters, uh, and we're going to be talking to a remote server. So we need that uh, server's IP address or uh, domain name. Uh, a username and password to connect to that machine as. And then uh, because we're doing it over SSH, uh, the default port is 22, but uh, could very well be running SSH on a different port or through a proxy or uh, something like that um, that uh, changes that port number. So those are our 
uh, default input variables and or uh, input parameters, uh, and there's um, no global variables, at least uh, in this uh, example. So the open session object is going to make a connection from whatever computer this script is running on to that remote computer uh, via SSH. So I can send this script out to uh, a Windows server um, out at my um, uh, out of my customer site, and then use that to make uh, an SSH connection to, you know, uh, let's say one of its managed switches or a uh, Linux box or what have you, uh, and tell it to reboot. Um, and if I can't make that remote connection from uh, where I am, because that port is blocked or what have you, I can still make that connection from within the network as long as I can put this script on that uh, machine that's on the network. Uh, it's seemingly a, uh, you know, maybe a tool for uh, nefarious purposes, but um, there's a fine line between a hacking tool and a, um, a remote support tool. So uh, in this case, we're going to uh, assume that you're using it for um, remote support. Um, so uh, we're going to open up that session. We're going to use the uh, IP number for the remote server, uh, username and password to connect as, and then uh, the port uh, for connecting on uh, uh, SSH. And once that session is open, uh, it will allow us to reuse uh, what's called the session ID. And uh, as long as that uh, connection stays open, we can send and receive commands uh, over that connection um, as uh, strings of text. So we're going to send it a command to run. In this case, it's just you know change directories. Um, going to wait a certain amount of time uh, before we give up and drop that connection. So in this case, 60 seconds. Um, but during that time, it's going to be waiting for the, um, uh, the response from the server to say, you know, uh, whatever, um, uh, whatever message we're looking for as far as, you know, a success message or, or whatever. Um, so it might be uh, you're telling it to run a, a certain program, and then when that program is done, it will say done, um, and then ask for the next command, at which point you can then send it the next command. Um, and you can string these together as, uh, as many as you want, as long as your, um, your session never times out and you, um, you never end up with a you know, a situation where you don't get the expected response. Um, so if you are running a series of common commands, like, you know, uh, every day I need to log into the server and tell it to, um, you know, uh, move this file into archive or, you know, uh, turn on the lights or uh, turn on your uh, Internet of Things toaster, you know, make coffee. Uh, if you have a a set of commands that you know will work and uh, a set of responses that you will expect to get back each time you run those commands, you can string them together in a very simple way to have your uh, remote Windows server or Windows machine, desktop, what have you, uh, connect to whatever has an SSH server on it. So like I said, uh, Linux box, Windows server, you name it. Uh, if it's got an SSH port open, uh, you can essentially script it to do, uh, to do your bidding this way. So uh, kind of a uh, strange edge case, but uh, worth including in the bootcamp um, because it does have um, some, uh, Uh, it does have some potential uses for uh, 
troubleshooting and fixing things that maybe you can't reach out and connect to directly. And so before we get to um, the uh, Q&A portion uh, of the presentation, um, talk a little bit about where to find those um, uh, bits and pieces of your day that you can automate. So what do you have uh, in your toolbox that, uh, you know, or in your daily routine that can be handled by a, a script or an automation policy? One of the things that we suggest is, you know, if you're looking to get um, to get more experience in writing automation, uh, is ask your colleagues, ask your coworkers, you know, what are they spending time on? Is there something that annoys them that they have to keep doing every day? Um, if you are, uh, if you're able to script it, to uh, create a policy for them to use to, uh, you know, save themselves five minutes or, you know, an hour a month or whatever, uh, then not only do you get to uh, reap the benefits of uh, the automation itself, so you know, you're saving yourself time, um, but also you've made uh, you've made a friend that uh, you know that owes you one. So um, the other thing that uh, automating your uh, daily grind tasks will do is give you more time to learn more interesting things. Um, you know, learn another programming language or study for a certification or um, basically get ahead. So uh, if you are looking for advancement, one of the things that uh, is obviously helpful to do is um, automate yourself uh, and the, um, the annoying little things that take you a few minutes at a time down to um, only taking a few seconds. And then you have all that extra time to uh, work on getting a promotion. After the webinar is over, if you're interested in uh, finding more resources for um, the automation manager, uh, looking through the automation cookbook, uh, or going through our training for other uh, topics, uh, all the other products that we offer, um, please do click on the uh, MSP Institute. Uh, you will need to register for that, though registration, uh, registration is free. Um, and you can sign up for our uh, office hours and other boot camps like this one. All right, so uh, I will go ahead and call it uh, a day, and uh, I will see you on the other side.